The topic that we're going to be discussing next um, is associated with these extreme environmental conditions, uh, well, just in general, but is exacerbated by these environmental conditions because of how the plant responds. And that's the topic here of photorespiration. So in our, um, our document that has several different uh, video clip links, uh, shows one here that does a nice uh, review of um, photorespiration. So we're going to move down here and it's helpful to talk about what happens with CO2 concentration in these environmental conditions. So when temperature increases, the plant gets, um, reaches a level or temperature level that causes, uh, causes clumping of uh, rubisco of um, the oxygen evolving complex and other proteins in the light reactions, other enzymes particularly. And so of course that's going to uh, potentially lead to a dismantling of the light reactions and can increase the risk of photo inhibition or oxidative damage leading to photo inhibition. So how does the plant respond? Um, to make sure that the temperature doesn't get too high and cause all of this damage. So the plant responds um, by using its temperature regulation uh, mechanism, uh, which is by increasing transpiration. Transpiration is our equivalent of sweating, so transpiration rates uh, will increase. Um, however, that will lead to an excess loss of water and so there's this trade-off between the loss of water um, and the incoming CO2 concentration. So to prevent excess loss of water, then it will end up closing um, their stomata to s conserve water, uh, which was, you know, c feeds back onto then temperatures may continue to increase. So that's kind of a, a, a place that's difficult to, to, to manage in terms of the the highest risk. Um, but a closure of stomata then is going to have cause a trade-off, as we just mentioned. A tra there's a trade-off between conserving water and for taking in CO2, CO2 uptake. All right, so if the stomata are closing, then there's less carbon dioxide entering the leaf and uh, moving into the Calvin uh, cycle. So the graph that we see over here shows us internal CO2 concentration uh, versus net photosynthesis rate. And it looks similar to our light response curves where we had irradiance along the x-axis, but in this case we're looking at um, the CO2 concentration in parts per million. And as CO2 concentration increases, we see that um, CO2 limited region of the graph, just like we saw with the light limited region of the graph here, such that as CO2 concentration increases, then photosynthesis rate increases. Um, and so this part of the graph is just simply limited by the diffusion rate of CO2. Then once a certain level of concentration of CO2 is reached, then the photosynthesis rate starts to level off, and that's because we have perhaps rubisco saturation or RUBP, which is the CO2 acceptor molecule. This is the enzyme, remember, and this is the CO2 acceptor. Um, RUBP limitation um, in terms of the CO2 acceptor availability. So there's some biochemical uh, limitation here, or there could just simply be some feedbacks from the light reactions where um, there isn't enough ATP or, or NADPH, depending on what the light level is here. But if we're looking at optimal light levels, then it's likely uh, the Calvin cycle components that are limiting that rate. Like the light reactions or the light response curve, we saw that there was a compensation point here and below, so this is what we're going to focus on right here, is that at this point, uh, when CO2 concentrations get low enough, then photosynthesis rate drops. And so we're interested in this part of the graph because there is a, um, a ratio that we want to consider here between carbon dioxide and oxygen. And as CO2 concentration dec decreases, this CO2 to oxygen ratio decreases. And why is that important? Because Rubisco 
which actually stands for ribulose 1 5 bisphosphate and here's the enzyme part carboxylase slash oxygenase um, is an enzyme that not only fixes carbon dioxide but, can, but it can also bind to oxygen. So when the CO2 concentration gets low enough then the oxygen uh, concentration uh, can basically oxygen can outcompete CO2 for that binding site. So the binding site that um, the active site that uh, allows CO2 to bind to uh, Rubisco can also bind to oxygen. And when it binds to oxygen, then we look over here, here's Rubisco. And this is what happens when CO2 binds to Rubisco. We see the, the Calvin cycle um, generalized here where 3-phosphoglycerate is the result of the carboxylation stage and RUBP, which is the CO2 acceptor, remember that 5-carbon component there, uh, gets regenerated. All right. That's an important differential uh, difference to make here. When oxygen is the substrate for Rubisco, then we have something different going on. This uh, results in oxygenation of RUBP, uh, which doesn't just produce um, two 3-phosphoglycerates anymore. It produces one 3-phosphoglycerate molecule and one 2-phosphoglycolate uh, molecule. <coughs> And 2-phosphoglycolate is a toxic sort of um, product that will then have to be broken down through the process of photorespiration. So that's what we're going to continue to talk about here. Photorespiration <coughs> um, ulti ultimately produces carbon dioxide um, without uh, ATP synthesis. In other words, normally we talk about cellular respiration resulting in the um, product of being carbon dioxide uh, as a result of ATP synthesis. But in this case, oxygen is used, carbon dioxide is the product, but no ATP synthesis has occurred. This is a wasteful process here. And so that's one problem. And a second problem is that even though photorespiration ultimately does um, have a product that leads back to the synthesis of 3-phosphoglycerate, this, uh, this pathway here that we're looking at does not, um, here it does, not regenerate RUBP, the CO2 acceptor. So we've, we've, we're just looking at this cycle right in here. So we don't see a, a, re, a regeneration of RUBP as resulting from photorespiration. So it, it ends up being a wasteful process. All right, so the next few diagrams sort of outline some of the details. Um, just a little expanded view of part of what we just looked at. In uh, this diagram, we can see that uh, in, under normal scenarios, we have that ribulose bisphosphate, uh, ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate, um, bonding with carbon dioxide and producing two 3-phosphoglycerates, two 3-PGAs. Okay. Um, whereas when we're looking at photorespiration here, we can see, again, ribulose bisphosphate um, is the acceptor. Rubisco is the enzyme, just like in carboxylation step there. Uh, but in this case, the, the other uh, reactant is oxygen. Oxygen is uh, getting fixed with ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. And as a result, we have one molecule of 3-PGA produced along with uh, one 2-phosphoglycolate. Uh, um, and so this is the molecule that goes through that, that, um, that additional cycle that we saw down he up here um, to get rid of 2-phosphoglycolate since it's a toxic form. So in essence, we have uh, under normal circumstances, this 5-carbon uh, RUBP combines with CO2 to make a 6-carbon molecule which splits into two 3-phosphoglycerates. Uh, in photorespiration, we, ha we don't have a carbon dioxide. We have an oxygen molecule that gets um, uh, fixed by a ribulose bisphosphate. So it's still a 5-carbon molecule that um, results as the product getting split into one 3-carbon molecule, which is 3-PGA and one 2-carbon molecule, which is 2-phosphoglycolate. So then the 3-PGA 
does go on to form G3P, but if you compare the uh, output from normal circumstances to uh, under photo photorespiration, you can see that we have 50% reduction, 50% um, uh, reduction in sugar output or production. All right. Uh, let's see, we also have 50% reduction or, or decline in the amount of RUBP that is regenerated because 2-phosphoglycolate, as we said earlier, does not regenerate ribulose bisphosphate. All right, so now if we take this down in, into even more detail here, which is um, just to clarify the process, um, not so much interested in all of the details that we see here, but just to clarify what's happening. Um, in photorespiration, we have, uh, uh, we, this is where the 2-phosphoglycolate uh, is produced, and that phosphate group that we see right here is going to be removed, and the, glyco the um, glycolate aspect of the, that's left of the molecule is going to be transported out of the chloroplast, which the C stands for, and into the peroxisome. Um, so this is another organelle. Um, so here we see it going into the peroxisome where the glycolate is converted into a glyoxylate, uh, and in so doing that produces some hydrogen peroxide, which has to be broken down into, which is also toxic, has to be broken down into water um, by a catalase enzyme. Um, the glyoxylate can be then converted into glycine, and this is an amino acid, so it has to receive an amino group here. And glycine can then, uh, two of these molecules here are shown then being exported into the mitochondria. So here's the mitochondria, chondrion, mitochondrion, mitochondria is plural. Now we're looking at a total of four carbons here between these two glycine molecules. One of these glycine molecules is going to be, let's say it's this one here, is going to be um, broken down into um, to remove a carbon dioxide. So one of the carbons gets released as carbon dioxide, and that's our product um, of photorespiration, the CO2 that comes out of photorespiration. The remaining carbon is going to be transferred over here to produce a 1, 2, 3 carbon serine. So serine then can be transferred back to perox the peroxisome, um, converted into a glycerate, Glycerate can then be transferred to chlorophyll once again with a, um, which in this point is ATP phosphorylated, ADP. Um, and when ATP phosphorylates the glycerate, then we end up with that 3 phosphoglycerate or 3 PGA. So that's how 3 PGA can be um, reformed. But that's not a result of converting um, RUBP or tr fixing RUBP with CO2, which then gets converted into 3PGA. So this, this cycle here that we've just followed from the chloroplast through the peroxisome into the mitochondrion and back uses energy, so it's not very energy cost uh, effective, and it does not uh, regenerate, whoops, where are we? It does not uh, regenerate this pentose phosphate group, which is the RUBP, because it, it bypasses that step. It's all within this um, cycle here. So those are the costs associated with um, with um, ph photorespiration. And as we said down here, the CO2 uh, product, um, which is the product in the mitochondria, does not coincide with um, the production of ATP like cellular respiration does. So if this is such an energy cost um, to the plant, then why does photorespiration actually exist, we might ask? Well, it does use, it's a way to use up excess energy and prevent photo inhibition is one uh, advantage. Um, even though it's not very effective for using that energy. So C4 and CAM photosynthesis are two pathways that evolved to reduce the amount of photorespiration, which is what we'll be talking about next.